This conference will now be recorded. Good morning once again and welcome to Rivers to Science webinar and hands-on workshop on optimizing power and timing of risk pipe based systems. Today we're going to expand all the way from IPs, processors, and large systems. I'm your host, Deepak Shankar, and today I'll be spending the next 45 to 50 minutes walking you through how you can construct models and how you can uh, do analysis and be able to uh, conduct a variety of experiments with test cases and traffic uh, in making your architectural decisions. Uh, a little bit of logistics before we get started. There is a chat window on the logistics on the uh, uh, control panel on your right hand side. You can type in your questions and uh, at the end of the uh, session or during the session, somebody will be available to either type in the answers or even uh, communicate the answers to the system. With this, I would like to get started. A recording of the uh, session and the slides that we're providing here will be provided uh, at the end of the session. In addition, for all of you that have downloaded the software, some guidance we provided in terms of tutorials and templates that are already available in Wittelsen that you could try out um, as part of your uh, studies or as part of your uh, hands of workshop program. With this, I'd like to get started. A quick roll into the agenda. Today, we're going to start off with a quick introduction to uh, system modeling. And from there, we're going to look at uh, specifically the problems related to risk five, and then look at demonstrations, analysis, and comparison that you can do with a similar system modeling environment. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about an introduction to Mirabilis Design and give you a profile of who we are and what we can provide or offer you. So introduction to system modeling. <laughs> Let's start off with something very basic. So you have a system, and that system can be an SOC or it can be a large system, has two processors or two cores, IOs, VSPs, bridges, and a bus. So <clears throat> that is your basic hardware system. Now, on top of this, you want to be able to run some applications. The applications are going to be the basic entities that are going to provide you the uh, activity that is going to trigger this particular hardware system. In this case, we have an activity which is an application consisting of four tasks, and it has a variable input stream. So there's a variable rate of data coming in, and they trigger each one of these. Each one of these are called tasks, and then the activity between them is called the transfer between tasks. The reason the transfer is critical is because a lot of times, the overhead is not because of processing on the risk five or on a process core, but rather it's on the activity related to the buses, the networks, the bridges, uh, uh, memories, and other types of uh, resources that are that go along with the processing. So when we want to look at the system, the first and foremost is we want to map these different tasks to different uh, resources. We call them each hardware component is called a resource, or each processing component is called a resource. And then the activities between them are mapped as transfers. Now, within a single system, you can actually have multiple of these applications running. So here, for example, you can see the second one has a different type of map. And we try to do with it, and it's got a different type of transfer between them. So what do we do with trying to creation of each of these hardware components? What should be the buffer, the clock speed, the uh, scheduling algorithms, the, uh, the width, all of these kind of questions. The other thing is to look at efficient ways, how you can deploy this uh, software. People call it uh, hardware software partitioning, uh, multi-core timing analysis, and things like that. The, the key thing here is to really come up where just being more efficient by spending more time processing between the resources of the Z doing transfer, which is these kind of colorful uh, movements. The other aspect, which tends to be left to the side, but is actually very critical, is power consumption. Now, power consumption can be looked at as you know what happens from the time 
the task comes in or the traffic comes in to trigger the software application or it can be how much time is each one the, the amount of product power consumed by each one of these resources so when we do our trade-offs the important thing to remember is it's a power performance trade-off which you can look at it as power throughput power latency or power uh, data transfer memory any of those attributes but power should be a significant decision maker in your process. And uh, that's part of the architecture exploration. Now, before we get started, let's take a quick look at Visual Sim. Let's take a quick look at how Visual Sim is set up so you can understand the usage. Visual Sim is this graphical modeling environment, has a set of libraries on the left hand side. Using these library components, you build up your hardware architecture. Then you have the second piece of it, which is your software or your application. I wouldn't want to use the word software, but though in this case the software, it can also be an application because it can be that parts of it are executing in, uh, on hardware platforms, which I'm going to show you as accelerated a little bit further down this uh, experiment. Now, things that you would add on to your application side would be the workloads, and then of course the uh, application itself. Notice. There are two types of uh, names that show up here. One says task, the other says transfer. As we saw earlier, the tasks are mapped to one of these four components. The transfers are really going between them to the CPU to DSP, so which means bus one, bridge bus two, go to the transfer. So you have two ways you describe your application. You have your workload plus what's a task and then what's the transfer. So you provide the sequence. Now, in this case, it's really a sequential one, but you could have control, you could have interrupts, you could have events and other processes to make it a much more complex um, uh, description of your application. Now, the other parts of the system are uh, things that would do parameters. The reason parameters are important is because you want to run a variety of sequences or a variety of trials through your uh, particular design and try to come up with what's the best configuration. The other piece of it is your power, which stores all your power information. The third one is, of course, all the statistics and reports and all of those that need to be generated as part of the model. Now, in this case, I'm going to show you a very specific analysis, which is we're running simulation using two parameter variations for the bus speed. Now, we're, we could be doing a lot of others, and as you saw in the earlier diagram, there's about 10 different uh, parameters that can be modified. But for purpose of this particular analysis, we're only going to do two of them. So you can see we're only modifying the bus speed to be 200 versus 400 megahertz. And we're seeing what the performance difference. In this particular case, the performance is the response time for the second application, which is the lower application. And uh, what I have over here is the x-axis indicates the simulation time. So we ran it for about 3, 10 to the power of minus 5, which means we ran it about 30 microseconds. And this here shows me the latency to complete the task, which is from the time the workloads generated to the time I uh, put all those plotters there. Now, if you look at the blue line, that corresponds to the 400 megahertz, while the red line corresponds to the 200 megahertz. Now, if you notice, as you would expect, the 200 megahertz is obviously much slower relative to the 400 megahertz. But if you look at certain scenarios over here, you'll notice the 400 megahertz is actually running much slower than the 200 megahertz. So for example, over here, the 200 megahertz is about 1.33, while the 400 megahertz is at 1.55 microseconds. So it's almost about 10% uh, slower. Uh, some of them are a little uh, larger, 1.45 versus 1.15. So that's a much bigger variation. So these bring up the question of the variance, which is from the time you see the lowest level to 1.1 to the highest, which is 1.57, is a fairly large range of the 400 megahertz. But for the 200 megahertz, the range is much smaller, between 1.1 and maybe 1.5. So the smaller range. So really, the question is. Am I getting the benefits of moving to a faster process? Because remember, there's more power, there is uh, you know, higher cost uh, associated with uh, designing the system and uh, potentially higher voltage levels, things like that. So uh, do we really want to do that or is it better to go with the low one? So it really depends on 
I, are you willing to stay with a few peaks over here, but most of them are in the smaller range, or do you really need more of it to be at the lower range? That will help you make the decision as to which, uh, uh, you know, our, our topology or which parameter you want to go with. Now I'm going to move over to Visual Sim so I can show you the model. So this is the same environment you saw. You saw the libraries, and I can click on any one of these. Uh, Windows over here, uh, click on any one, and you can you know, generate a variety of uh, blocks that you can drag and drop. For example, you can drag and drop the processor, set up parameters, and run it. Or I can go down here and I can drag and drop, say, for example, the uh, Axi bus from the library over here, and I can drag and drop that. So any component I want is in the library, and I can just drag and drop them and start using them in my system. Now, these here are the traffic generators that are generating the traffic that flows through the model. So this is the one that triggers this application. Now, the mapping is done through what's called the named process, which is when I click here, you see this link here, the first parameter over here. And so this is mapped to IO, which is the name that's over here. Similarly, this one over here, the transfer says, first it does bus one, which is this. Then it goes to bridge, then it goes to bus two. So you can see what the transfer is. So you can define all your flows, including your uh, uh, tasks mapping to a particular resource and also the transfers going between these resources. A key aspect of your design before you start uh, doing any development is defining the, uh, the power table, which here is we're focusing only on the CPUs, GSP, and the buses. We have skipped the bridge, as you can see. There's uh, parameter values associated for each one of those. Now notice here that we are uh, defining these as parameters. They're linked up here, which as you can see is related to the clocks. That's what defines what my active power is, the, the uh, clock speed values over here. So if the clock speed has changed, the power value also changes. So it's kind of directly connected. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and run the simulation when I click on the go button here, the simulation starts executing, and which means you know data is flowing through these. And you can see a variety of plots. At this point, I'm not going to go into details of plots. I'll go into that uh, further down during our presentation. But you can see a variety of plots come up. So this one here, for example, is a power. This one here is a histogram showing me the difference between the processing and transfer time. And this one here shows me the latency for application two. So I can now go in and say change one of these uh, speeds over here. I can rerun the simulation. And I can see what happens. As you can see here, even though I went to a lower, I went to the lower speed, I ended up getting a lower uh, simulation, I mean lower uh, latency for application too. I can also keep uh, trying out some other experiments here. For example, I can make this two. And you can see now, when I made the first one go low, or made it slower, the latency dropped. But when I added the second one also to go slower, then the latency started spiking up. So you can use these experiments to try out. meant that the number of tasks entering the system was much more than what this uh, uh, what this uh, the CPU could handle. So which means that this is an unacceptable configuration. So now I have to go back here and change this and maybe try 300 and see if that will work. So I can try out different types of experiments. Even at 300, as you can see, it doesn't seem to work. So now I have to go back to uh, 400 and try out different experiments. So, as you can see, there is a, a variety of uh, statistics that I can generate. There's even textual stats that I can generate, which is related to, like for example, the DXP, you can see is 48% utilized, while you can see the IO is 81% utilized. So, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not just the uh, processors or the DSPs, but also you have to worry about the, you know, the uh, interaction related to the IOs or uh, 
if I go up to the bridges, you know, that's 49% utilized. So you can look at overall picture of what's really happening in my system. So for example, here gives me visibility into the power consumption. Now, power is based on the activity in my system and the configuration I have in that table there. So for example, here, if I set these to right here dots, what you see over here as I zoom in is at every point, there's either something has been activated or something has been uh, relieved. So it either moves from an active state to standby, standby to active, or stand. Or if I had power managed, which I'll be showing a little bit later, it could be going from um, uh, from the uh, power from one of these uh, power states down to a lower power state, like an idle state, based on some power management. So this is a quick introduction to Visual Sim, and as you can see, we have libraries, we have the components that help you uh, assemble up these systems, you have the analysis tools, you have the power tables, you have the parameters. So using all of these, you can assemble up the, the full design. So now that we've seen the basics of Visual Sim, we're going to move to the next level, where we're going to start looking at a full system and how it's affected by implementing um, uh, risk by using a risk by process. Now, right over here, you can see some additional statistics that you can get through with latency, buffer occupancy, as some additional statistics that you can also generate. I didn't show you as part of that then. Now, risk five, we uh, where we see it, we see three different types of uh, application areas in the system modeling can can be used at the IP level. So, this is a company that's building a risk by code, or it's you are doing risk by, uh, like, say, a Kyle Link uh, bus or uh, a memory controller, things like that. It can be a complete SOC, like someone building a full processor, or, uh, or even building some accelerators to go with a processor. And finally, the last one is someone that's building, say, an IoT device, or even an ECU device, or an SSD controller, and how they're going to operate in the context of a real system, which might be a network system, or it might be where it's accepting a lot of sensors and connecting to actuators as well. So we're going to walk through step by step through each one of them and try to understand how each one of them will operate. So we're going to start off with a block diagram of an SOC architecture. So the IP is something that fits in the SOC from our concept. So uh, what you'll see over here is, uh, you know, you can have vector extensions, there's a risk by code, you can have a tile link, AXI, AHD, any variation of buses. And of course, you can have multiple levels of caches, multiple memories, uh, accelerators. All of these can be used to assemble up the system. So why are we doing this analysis? The purpose of doing this analysis is for us to be able to get visibility. Oops, sorry about that. The reason for doing this analysis is for us to be able to get visibility into what is really happening in this particular system. So for example, we have now an application, which is a, a media application, and our target is the power has to be less than one watt, and the number of frames per second that we can process has to be over 13,000. That's our goal. We have come up with an initial architecture of this kind, and we're trying to see whether this is feasible and whether it's going to actually operate within the context of our system. Now, obviously, there are two things here. One is we got a performance and we got power, which means we have to do a power performance trade off concurrently. It's not just, just power or just performance, it has to be both of them taken concurrently. Now, this is the block diagram, and I'm going to move over to the block diagram in a minute. But what you can see over here is the same thing power management processor, the accelerators, bus, memory, and then of course this is your uh, behavior or your use case. So if you notice, the basic system I showed you and what I'm showing you now are starkly very, very similar. So most designs were, are built up along the same methodology, along the same way they're connected or uh, integrated into a block diagram. So from here I'm going to start off with something very basic. So this one here is a, a model that has a risk by code here, and it's a, uh, 
with an uh, in order uh, execution has a dma has buses and l2 and dram caches i can also have other variations of this type of designs i'm going to show you uh, one more design here which is uh, So here what you can have is you can replace the uh, AX side with a tile link. You could uh, <clears throat> you can have something that looks like this, which is, you know, I've got like uh, four risk scores. Two of them are directly connected to the tile link client to a, to a manager with a cycle after cache and a RAM. Or they can be, uh, you know, with the legacy system through an AXI bus. And connect the tile link uh, client and manager combination, or it can simply be an uh, in, an interface like a sensor or interface connected to PCIe bus that can be integrated into the system as well. So you can have any combination of these that are assembled together for the SOC, or even something on a board. It doesn't necessarily have to be on an SOC itself. Now. System like this can be used, like right here, can be used at the IP level, which means that I am uh, in a, evaluating, you know, what, how many bits, uh, what should be the clock speed, it should be in order, out of order, number of pipeline stages, what should be the cache sizes. So we're looking at really the IP or the core of the system. Now, from here, I can extend this. I can replace the same design, but now I'm going to be running it where I have a full SOC here. So I've got the subsystem, the accelerator, the bus, and the memories, and things like that with the software architecture right down here. So when I go ahead and run the simulation, and I apologize for some reason, I opened up an ARM based system as opposed to a RISC V, but I'll also show you a little later down the thing later on that how you can replace the arm in this with the risk five to the exact same model just that you know the uh, block alone with the instruction set is being reprinted. so it's something where you can very quickly uh, do your uh, analysis by just uh, swapping in and out different components now as part of this model what do we see we see obviously a timing diagram of all the different uh, components on the processor we also see the power consumption so you can see it's about one watt of power you can see here the amount of uh, frames that are processed, which is in the region of about uh, 50,000 frames. You can see what right now you had a spike right up front, but after that it's been pretty flat. This one is the accelerator, which right now we're not using. So you see that this is insufficient for our design. So we go ahead and uh, stop the simulation and say, you know what? I'm going to uh, take some of these and maybe move to a hardware accelerator. So what do I do? Right now, we saw based on earlier mapping, all of these components are mapped to the, uh, to the processor subsystem. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to change the thing to say I'm not going to do it in software. I'm going to now move it to hardware. So, what have I done? Same mapping, everything else mapped to accelerate, I mean, to, a hub, to the processor means you're running software. This one alone is mapped to a hardware accelerator. I'm going to go ahead and rerun the simulation. I try to see what's, what's going to happen in my particular uh, design. One of the things I can see right off when we're about one watt of power and we're actually ending up going much higher. So wait for a second, let's just run a little further so we can just see what the results look like. Uh, as you can see, we're running for approximately about uh, 140 uh, milliseconds, almost 0 0.14 seconds. So running a fairly large uh, site simulation. And uh, let's look at the power consumption here. So we hit about 1.65. So we're almost about 65% more than what our target was. Now let's look at the analysis here. But this one's actually doing quite well. Actually, it's uh, it's not doing well. It's uh, we're down to about earlier one was 5,000. Now we're at about 23,000 uh, frames per second. So so we've had a little bit of a change there. But here's the kicker. As you can see, the, the, the accelerator is consuming a huge amount of power. And my guess is 
a large portion of this acceleration, I mean, the increase in power is related to this activity right here. So what I'm going to do is, same design, but now if you notice I've got my power table here, and you can see the power for each one of these individual components. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a power management module to the system. So as we saw, the hardware accelerator was consuming a huge amount of power. So we're going to try to see if we can move this from, uh, you know, when it's sitting in standby and it's been there for about one millisecond, we're going to move it over to an idle state. We're going to see if that is going to have any performance impact on our system. Go ahead and rerun the same model. Remember, we still we created a model. We first did run everything in software. Then we replaced one of the mappings to run in hardware accelerator, which is the image we the And we saw the power was too high. So now what we're going to do is we're going to actually run it where we're now replacing that power with the uh, uh, with the power management module again. We didn't have to make any other changes to the model, just right at that one place, we had to go in and make the change. And you notice, we were right around here, about 1.1, we moved up to 1.2. So the, the nice thing is we now have this flow here where you can actually get the, um, uh, you know, you can see that I went from 1.65 down to about 1.1 in terms of power consumption. Now, the performance here has not degraded substantially, maybe a very minute amount. So from our stake, that's actually good. But here's the thing that's very interesting. Earlier, if you remember, we went from 0.2 to 0.6. Now we joined close to zero, which is where, you know, when it sees that it's idle, it, I'm sorry, when it's not doing anything in standby, it moves it to the idle stake, So, which was an important consideration for us because we needed this performance, but then we, uh, we needed to get this below the uh, threshold. So now let's look at the uh, thing over here. We zoom into a region. So you can see over here, you know, at this point there was a lot of activity, so it could not go to the standby. But right here, it dropped down to the standby state. And this was how we were able to reduce from about 1.65 to 1.1 watts of power. So, as you can see here, we've been doing a competitive trade-off of running power performance over the whole design right over here. Now, I'm going to go back since we started this off with the uh, uh, risk five. I'm going to go back here and pick up one of the more uh, the more complex systems. And I'm going to go ahead and rerun it. So what I have here is I've got four risk cores, and I've got I've got a instruction generator. So I'll talk about the risk core in a second. But I've got instruction generators that are now feeding traffic into the memory subsystem over here. While here I've got uh, two of these that are connected to an axis, and this one has an interface. So we're going to go ahead and uh, run the simulation again. And uh, what we see here now is you can start seeing we have all the different signals associated with the bus. So the grand act, the probe act, all of these different attributes are right over here. The, uh, you can also see the activity on the tile link, all the different uh, things. So here's something that's very important, the tracing. We actually maintain a trace of everything that the system goes through. So here, for example, you can see I came into the PCIe, master in, slave out, master in, slave out, went into the tile link, master four, went on channel A, and channel A out, slave, manager, and then and then on the way back, had the same sequence. So came back on channel B, and then came to channel C, and I came out. So you can actually see exactly what is happening. So here, for example, that is the PCIe. This shows you what my AXI equivalent was and what times they came in and out and what was the throughput at each one of these times. So it's possible for you to actually look at every single transaction that flows through and see exactly what happens. So here, for example, you can see exactly all the tile link messages and you know what the latency through the tile link was, all of those details are provided as well. So you get very detailed statistics on exactly what is happening 
through your particular system. And as you can see, very quickly you can start building up a very large system, you're not restricted to only like one core, one cross. And actually you can even build this up to have even 200 cores. So we have a customer that's building a system with like 200 cores in their design and you can put a, and with a knob, replace the tile link with a knob and you can have an extremely large design as well. Now, in this particular case, as I was mentioning, and I'm just showing this out loud, so you can actually see, we went between a software and a hardware solution, and what we're trying to do is looking at the power, the, uh, the statistics of the uh, frame, and also the power usage in terms of percent and actual uh, walks. So what you can do is you can see whether you know, it meets the performance, meets the power consumption, and you know, where you need to have accelerators, where you can you know, go with the software, and based on that, you can decide whether you want accelerators, whether you want to implement power management, what is the benefit. So not only are you saying that, hey, I need to put an accelerator, but you also have a justification for doing it. As you can see, uh, we run for about 20 milliseconds, took less than about uh, 10, 5 or 10 seconds to complete. So you can also see something that can be run very fast, and you can run a large number of iterations to get results. Now, we saw at an IP level, which we were looking at the core. Then we looked at a complete SOC. Now let's look at a full system. So I'm going to show you two different examples. The first example is showing you one where you know I've got a, a RISC, uh, RISC V based uh, SSD controller to a flash connected to PCI and NVM Express. And uh, we have this is the model. And you can see I've got the power for both the SSD with the RISC V and the NAND flash. So we're looking at the total power of this complete subsystem right away here. And uh, I think you can see the traffic generator generating all the different post requests, going to the PCIe with all the queues in the NVM, and they fit in with the risk, uh, risk by a base SSD. Now, this one has a single controller, but you can cascade this to create one which may have like 50 or 100 different uh, individual controllers. Now, one of the things you're going to notice here is interesting is this section here has its own power table, and the risk find the flash has its own power table. The reason for doing that is the assumption that you know the system should be constructed by multiple people, meaning that a part of it may be constructed by the uh, the host design team, the other part may be constructed by the AC team, but eventually they both need to be integrated. So you have the ability to separate out different parts of the design. And that's a very critical aspect. Of, you know how you can um, uh, build up a uh, design or build up components like these to allow you to very quickly work together as a team especially if you're a highly distributed team now reports again uh, every model generates different size sets of reports now in this particular case the reports we're following is the uh, read write latency on the ssd so we have the traffic rate at uh, 30 microseconds versus uh, 3 milliseconds, which is the time between different requests coming in. You can see the uh, write latency was about 30 uh, microseconds, while the read was uh, 400 nanoseconds, 400 to 600 nanoseconds. But then we moved to a microsecond uh, range, uh, time between requests. The latency uh, jumped up all the way to about 1.8 milliseconds. 1.8 milliseconds. So it's almost a thousand x, or I'm sorry, a hundred x jump between the uh, these. Even though you know my traffic was only a 10 x jump. So you can see how dramatic things can change. Now you can also see how the powers change. You went from about 2.5 to about 3.5. Not a whole lot, but the processor power. So this was on the SSD power. The processor power, though, notice we spiked up here and we came down about 0.5. But here, notice we spiked up, we stayed above the 1. watts for a while, and then we slowly slide it back down. So, as you can see, the, pro, the PCIe and the processor are doing a considerable amount of work before they are being fed into the SSD. And the SSD has a limited amount of capacity. This tells me, since they're both very close, tells me that the, even with this system here, the uh, capacity of the SSD and the, and the flash is almost at the peak. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the uh, SSD model. Now 
as I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel the, please go ahead and ask them right here. Um, that way you can uh, see uh, you know, see what's going on and so, so see what, uh, you know, if you have any questions right then and there, because that way I can also adjust my presentation to make sure I uh, complete, I answer or respond to those questions. Now, in this particular case, we see here a design where I got a PCIe bus, the NVM Express, and the risk file. So this was the, you go in here, this was that original design you saw earlier. That is what is being fed right over here. And of course, the NAND flash has its own set of details. It's got its own set of parameters and it's got a flash controller and all of those attributes as well. We're going to go ahead and rerun this simulation to see what's happening. And we end up getting errors. So one of the aspects of Visual Sim, which is very critical, is that anytime there's a syntactical, logical, or a model error, or even behavioral error, we would get errors and there would be an explanation. So we got an error message, an explanation as to what really ended up happening wrong in the system. So it says that this event thing could not be identified. So there was an error right here. So what we can do is we can go back to the model and we can go modify it. And not only does it highlight, it also highlights right here where the error was. So you can see that it was related to this line over here, which is event two. So it says that the event ID is not equal to two, true or false. So that's what we're uh, you know, trying to show you over here. So for now, just for simplicity standpoint, I'm just going to go ahead and release it so we can read on the simulation. And now what you can see is, uh, obviously I'll start off with the power, you can see what the SSD power was. Here's something that's important. One of the things you want to see is that, you know, if you connect your SSD to your processor, how much of performance benefit are you going to get? So this is your uh, MIPS over here. To show you for this particular SSD configuration, this is the amount of MIPS I'm getting out of my design, which is approximately about 220 MIPS is what I'm getting in my architecture right now. Shows you my latencies as well. So obviously, I can go ahead and uh, make changes. For example, I can uh, you know, change the clock rate to run this at a lower clock, say 200 megahertz. We run it, and we can see what happens. Notice the power here is uh, is not that it's gone down here and then starts spiking up, so it takes off takes a little bit longer to get done. But you notice when I went to 200 megahertz, the uh, MIPS dropped from about 220 down to about 90, almost 90. So here, you can actually see what is happening in my system. So based on this, you can make a decision, how fast should my processor be to get my, uh, you know, to get the overall uh, benefit of the overall latency. So this is the processor, the risk five processor that's right over here. So based on this, I can say, okay, if I need 90 MIPS or if I want, uh, you know, this amount of uh, latency, processor latency for a certain stream of traffic, right over here. This is the amount of process, this is the across the clocks. So what I'm going to do is go back to 500. I'm going to uh, make this E minus 6. I'm going to go ahead and rerun the same simulation and see what ends up happening. Okay, so we're able to get the 220 right over here. Obviously the power has gone up. It shot up quite a bit. But the latency, we were at like 1.3 or 1.4, it dropped down to 0.6. So just, you know, without changing the flash, just by changing the risk file, we can see what the performance difference is in the, uh, I'm sorry, changing the risk file clock speed. You can see exactly what kind of performance benefit and what is the power that we're consuming in that. So allows you to be able to evaluate what is the, what is the benefit or what's the, uh, uh, architecture going to look like based on these types of simulation blocks. Now, and as you see, you can, uh, we actually have a tool for the post processor where results can be saved and then you can run them within the uh, environment where you can compare results from multiple runs and see, you know, what the behavior is. In this case, the difference is huge, so that's why I don't want to plot the post-processor results. Now, one of the things that uh, a number of our customers like to do is really processor evaluation. Do I go with an A53 or do I go with a RISC-V? Which one's the better option? So, 
you know, we look earlier ones we were looking at, we assumed we're going to the risk five, and we started building up everything based on risk five. But now we're saying, wait a minute, I'm not 100 percent sure I want to go with risk five. Let me see if there are other alternates. You know, what would be the uh, benefit of going with say an A53 versus a risk by four that might be available. So one of the things you can do is in this particular case, our focus is on the latency and power like we did earlier. We want to try to do a comparison between them. And for that, we took the NP bench as a test case. So we know that these are the different functions, number of instructions, and these are the different profiles. Based on this, we generate instructions for both the uh, risk file and for the A53 for ARM. And uh, what we do is this is the uh, risk file configuration. So you can see that uh, this one is an in order execution. We also have an uh, out of order execution risk file model as well that you can configure. But the main thing is you can go in and configure any of the attributes of this model here, including the pipeline. You can go modify the pipeline. You can set you know whatever the uh, number of bits you want. You can specify the number of registers. Any one of these attributes you can change. And you can define exactly what the risk file code is going to do. So, for example, in this configuration right over here, where we, this was the model I should have taken up, but I took up the ARM model. Apologize for doing that. But this risk file model over here, you can also set up other things. For example, the partitioning, you know, what was the call rate, which is what rate calls are coming into the trigger device, the bus speed, and other types of attributes as well. So, you can actually set up these kind of uh, scenarios or situations for your uh, for your particular design. So this one here is the uh, risk by model, the same A53 that I ran earlier, but I'm now running the risk by version of it. This was the setting for the uh, uh, A50, uh, the A53. Now notice there's an error here, just should say 32 bit L2 dash, not a 64 bit. But, uh, and I've got an A53 model, same thing. And uh, but notice here this is a five stage, eight stage pipeline. That I believe the risk five was a five stage pipeline. We kept the clock speeds to be the same. Both of them are running fine in megahertz processors. But you can see now how the latency has changed. The A53 has got uh, in this particular case actually uh, ends up having some spikes at regular intervals. But the uh, overall latency is uh, actually a little bit higher for the A53. Compared to the risk file. So, in this particular case, when I do the comparison, I'll say the risk file is actually slightly lower in terms of peak latency. Now, the rest of it looks pretty similar, just for the peak alone, there is a difference. And this again is for the NP benchmark. It's not for a general case. For other cases, you might generate other sets of instruction sequence that you might want to run through the process system. Power consumption the uh, A53 has got. Uh, you know, 160 watts of power, while the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, 160 uh, milliwatts of power, while the risk file got about 130 milliwatts of power. So in this case also, the risk file is actually better than the A53 model. So obviously, you know, the uh, we took a very specific A53 and a very specific risk file configuration, where you can actually see that the risk file in this case, both power-wise and performance-wise, was much better. You can see, you know, what's the uh, average power consumption between the two as well. Now, before I move on to the software, I want to show you one more system. So, one of the things that you want to do is not just have. So, we saw the IP, we saw an SOC, we saw a system, but you can expand that to something much larger, which is you can put this on a network. So, say for example, you're building an IoT device, you're building a, a phone or a watch or any other device. Not only do you want to see how it behaves in the context of the uh, uh, of you know the actual box itself, but also how it behaves in the context of the, of the environment. So in this case, we're going to take an IoT and plug it onto a network hub. Now, what changes here is that uh, we now have the wireless networking that is connecting this. IoT device to a local hub, so these are devices connected to a set of hubs. And from there, we go through the backbone, which is the router edge router, to the data center. So you can actually do a complete end to end analysis of going from the device all the way to the data center coming back. So, why is that important? The reason it's important is the risk file is one piece, 
But then, you know, here, for example, like your comparison between, say, an M0 and a RISC-5. But now what you also have, you have the sensor, the, uh, the AFP. You can also have, like, the uh, radio transmitters and the, uh, the RF and the antennas. You can also plug in your battery blocks. So now what happens is I've got the complete IoT model right over here, and I can see what the performance difference is. So it's now no longer just like, tell me what my power consumption is, but rather I've got a battery, and tell me what's my battery life cycle, what's my battery usage based on uh, maybe a type of charging mechanism that I'm using. So I can use a turbo charger, just a regular charger, or I can do a custom charger. And I can select a different type of uh, battery type as well that will tell me also what's a battery life cycle and things like that. This case is interesting because we also have an energy harvester, which is you know a time based, so it could be a motor type energy harvester that's in addition to this thing running is also continues charging the battery. So we're not letting the battery drop too much, it's going down a little bit, but not significantly uh, compared to what you would do if you didn't have a energy harvest. So now, what you're looking at is a different type of an analysis here. And what this means is you're uh, trying to analyze not just the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the latency, the MIPS, the power consumption, all of those inside of the device, but you also want to see what your end-to-end -end latency is. So now you see there's a different set of statistics we're generating. So here, you can see what the average power is for device 4. You can see what the instant power is. So for example, if I zoom in here, you can see that I've got these slight spikes. And you can also see what the instantaneous power is for device 1. This tells me the statistics for, the, uh, you know, for each one of these blocks as well. You know, what's your utilization? My latency and buffer occupancy. So notice my network hub has some buffering that's happening right over here that can also be spelled up where you can see these different spikes. You can see most of them, the latency is right over here, but you can also see network spikes over here. That's causing some of these things to be buffered back, back over here as well. So using this, not only can you expand your search beyond the device itself, but you can also see how it works in the context of a complete network. Now, one of the questions that comes up is, and this is a very critical aspect, which is, how do you model the software? The reason that this is very important is because the software determines the, uh, how you can model the performance of your system. Unfortunately, when you're doing architecture exploration, you don't really have the software. You don't even know the details of the software hasn't even been completed. So what we provide you is two things. One is the workload. What is the workload in the system? It can be the sensors and interfaces, or it can be the trigger to run your software. So we can either be a distribution, or you can take a trace from an existing design. Software can be described in three different ways. The first way is a task flow diagram. Like you saw in the earlier models, it had uh, this task flow, and you had block by block by block. It went from one block to another block to another block, or you can have more complex uh, act activations as well. That one helps you capture what is happening in this particular application. So the workload can trigger it, and then you can have the, uh, you know, the task itself being uh, you know, activated by you know, the previous task, having data available that triggers this task, or this can run independently of all the other tasks. So that is one way. The second way is, like how we did with the NP benchmark, you can do a synthetic instruction sequence. So you, for every task or every function, you can say how many integer processes, how much floating point, how many uh, branches, how many uh, uh, you know load store operations, how many multiplies. You can specify all of that, and based on it, Visual Studio will actually generate an instruction sequence that can then be that can then trigger the processor module to run. So a sequence for RISC V will look very different from a sequence for ARM, obviously because the instruction set is different. A third option is running an ISS, an instruction set simulator. In this case, what happens is you can run an ARM and you can put Linux or any other operating system on top of it and then run your application on top of it. And then the output of that can then be fed into a Visual Sim hardware model, 
either as a trace or in real time, and then it can uh, you know, power the rest of the system. So you have that ability to do as well to allow you to see how your overall system behavior is based on some existing piece of SQL. So if you have a benchmark code or something, you can connect the gem file to this one and then run it in the context of the entire system. So it allows you to do that type of a functionality as well. Now, note that GemFi is an open source technology. It has a lot of these processor models available, uh, including RISC, ARM, uh, PowerPC, uh, Leon, uh, x86, and things like that. Um, and then we do have a custom interface between GemFi and Visual Simple Run, run and Through. So with this, I would all wrap up the uh, presentation by talking a little bit of reiterating what we saw. System modeling using Visual Sim for RISC-V can be used to evaluate at the IP level where I want to see do I need accelerators? Do I, how many cores do I need? What should be the uh, bus topology? Do I go with a NOC or the tile link or the network? On, I'm sorry, with an AXI bus. And note, we have all of these different libraries available in Visual Sim. Then, the other one is you can look at the SOCs. Uh, so you can use like off-the-shelf components, integrate them together and see what the performance is. Or you can build applications like you saw the IOTs and the SSDs using the risk file. Now, for those of you that have downloaded software, like we're sending the presentation, you can uh, follow these examples here and try to understand how Visual Sim can be used in your particular uh, scenario. Now, let me talk a little bit about Metaverse design. We've been around for about 15 years now, and we have a variety of customers in a variety of application segments. And over every year, we've been adding newer and newer innovative technologies and uh, expanding across the world. Today, we have uh, support design centers in uh, three locations, and we have support and sales centers in eight locations. So we've expanded quite uh, rapidly. And we've had a lot of uh, successes and uh, awards over the years that we have received. Now, Miracle's Design has two businesses. One is the Visual Sim software, the software package you saw. But we also provide training and services, anything from building library blocks to custom models, all the way to doing complete architecture evaluations. Now, quick introduction to Visual Sim, which you saw as a tool. The main focus is timing, throughput, and power. But we can also expand that to building the entire electrical system. When I say entire electrical engineering, it's the hardware, software, semiconductors, network, uh, all of those come into one particular design or one particular model. Applications which can be used as you saw IOTs, automotive, industrial, and even uh, aerospace and uh, space applications. One of the new features that we're adding in Visual Sim, and we already have a lot of components available in our first half uh, offering, is the ability to do failure studies, diagnostics, and functional analysis. Now, what are the key applications of Visual Sim? The biggest thing is really architecting the system. It can be anything from a processor all the way to a complete car or a complete uh, flight avionics. One of the key aspects in systems is really saying, hey, this is my application, so this is my autonomous driving, or this is my radar or my engine control. How do I map it across the distributed system? that might be across, say, a PCIe or a VPX or Ethernet or AFPX. Then, of course, the other piece of it, which is doing my very early study stage, like say I'm doing a baseband 5D processor, and I'm looking at, uh, you know, how do I compute the resource requirements for this? So, you know, I've got a task graph that has variable number of instances for each stage. How many resources of DSPs or accelerators do I need for each of the stages? Or do I have, like, a central pool? And how many of those do I need to do? The big thing is being able to generate the test uh, test activities, which is the you know either for compliance or for generation of diagnostics or even for verification downstream. So we provide you those uh, you know, ability for you to generate all of those. This is the Visual Sim library. As you can see, it's a fairly large uh, composition. Uh, we keep adding new libraries almost once every two weeks, once a month. So you're likely to get about 20, 24 updates a year in terms of new libraries that we provide. For example, this month's new library was Tiling. Last month was HPN 2.0. So we had keep adding newer and newer libraries every single month. Matter of fact, I think next month we're going to be putting network gateways in our uh, in our package. 
Uh, one of the key things in Visual Sim, as you saw, I opened up a number of models. Those are called templates. They provide you the starting scenario for constructing your system. So we have templates for about almost 150 different applications in Visual Sim. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the main purposes are capacity planning, resource efficiency, throughput, and buffer usage. And we are, to make those decisions, we do the timing and power planning. On that, we can apply security and data analysis uh, into the design to try and see how my system behaves if I, if I embed a failure into the system or I add a security component to the system. You know, is my buffer uh, buffering uh, sufficient or do I need to increase the amount of buffer? So, how does Visual Sim really benefit your organization? One of the key things is a lot of companies have started using system modeling, but it's still in a very nascent stage. The reason being is the time it takes to construct these models. This is where Visual Sim comes in. Rather than taking six months to create a model, say in C++ or System C, within a month you can create a new model. So, what you're doing is rather than waiting for six months, you're already spending a lot of time doing analysis. And this really helps because you're not finding bugs while you're doing your implementation. You're finding bugs before you start your implementation, which means that I can even start my refinement before I start my implementation. So it is the highest quality product. The other piece of it is because I'm not doing rework, plus I know exactly what my final product is going to look like before I start building it. I can reduce my uh, my project schedule, and based on our experience, this is what is the average time period we've seen between 24 and 30 percent. Obviously, that translates to a huge increase in the revenue potential of your product. So, this is one of the reasons why, or the main reason why, people adopt Visual Sim, which is the speed of modeling and, so, and the availability of this large set. So with this, I'd like to wrap up the presentation. I appreciate all of you spending the time listening to us and attending this thing. I'm available now to answer any questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them on the chat window, and I'll be happy to answer them. There are no more questions. Appreciate your time uh, for attending this. And there are, oh, wait. Um, one question has just come up, which was the question was Can you give us more details on your customers? We have four types of customers for Visual Sim. We have the uh, large system customers, people building uh, cars, Tier 1 suppliers, uh, aerospace companies, uh, space agencies. We also have the smaller guys, smaller products, which are the semiconductors, so anything from uh, companies that are providing, uh, you know, uh, sensor-based systems, providing processors, SOCs, any combination of those. So we have uh, uh, both these types of customers as well. So uh, to give you an idea, anything from automotive having uh, GM and Denso to uh, satellite systems having uh, people like NASA, JPL, Indian Space Research, to aerospace being Boeing, Northam Grumman, Rockwell Collins, to uh, the uh, uh, semiconductors, the analog devices, IBM, uh, AMD, and folks like that. So we've got over 60 uh, customers. Uh, at the last count, we had over 250 different products that have been built using this. Thank you. Go ahead and type your questions. Any others? Feel free to ask them. Um, I would say it's 50-50. Uh, 
uh, we have both uh, the system and the semiconductors. We've got an equal uh, uh, distribution. If you go to our website, you can actually see, and I can send a link to our list of customers, at uh, least customers that allow us to publicly uh, tell their names. Uh, but yeah, it's about 50 50 between big systems and uh, semiconductors. Anybody, any more questions? Go ahead and feel free to type them and I can answer those questions. Now, do remember we have a number of additional uh, hands-on workshops coming up in the next uh, uh, next uh, four weeks. So, uh, do check out our sign-up page or go to our front home page and look at the list. And you can always uh, uh, attend one of those other sessions as well. Um, with this, I'd like to conclude this uh, uh, hands-on workshop. Uh, feel free to contact us at any time and we'll be sending you the video link and also the uh, presentation from the session.